Knowledge lives in many houses, many homes. It doesn't have a single domicile. And of course, universities are a very powerful and key element within the larger picture of how research and knowledge is produced. But there are many other spaces, particularly in the cultural fields where uh, knowledge is housed. Uh, and, and museums are one of those institutions. Uh, museums uh, have, are the guardians of a very large portion of the human record. Uh, much of it is in deep storage. Uh, small portions of it are exhibited and accessible to, to audiences. And they certainly play a key role, in, particularly in the humanities fields, uh, because of their role as, in a sense, the guardians of the cultural record. So one of the questions that museums as an institution have, have faced, and, and it's, these questions are questions that interest me as a knowledge designer, as a digital humanist, really has to do with what it means to be a guardian of a large corpus of cultural materials in the internet age, in the digital age. Um, traditional, the traditional definition of the museum was very much focused on um, the brick and mortar, the physical structure of the museum as the sort of device that in a sense supports uh, cultural programming, allows for certain modes of controlled access to the cultural record, tells stories of one kind or another. Um, serves as a sort of point of conversation, of encounter between the scholarly community and the general public. Uh, but, um, of course, today such institutions are increasingly institutions whose real facade is not the brick and mortar, the physical facade of the building that opens up out onto a city street or a square, but rather the, the website that serves as the first point of encounter between the general public, the audience, uh, even the scholarly community for that matter, even other fellow museum professionals and any given institution. The true facade is in a sense their website. And many of the inventory systems, uh, the systems that represented and documented the collections that make up a given museum, of course, many of those inventory systems are increasingly moving out into public spaces, into visible spaces through websites. Uh, so what do we do with all that stuff? Uh, we can, of course, display a collection as a series of discrete individual objects with a picture, you know, a photograph, and a record description. And um, that doesn't, um, of course, that provides a certain kind of service, but it doesn't really do very much. Uh, if you're in the business of telling bigger stories, stories about human culture, stories about historical epics, uh, stories about a, a given community. So one of the big challenges that museums as an institution face, and in the company certainly of archives and libraries, is how to, in a sense, build bridges between the continuing physical mission that they have, which is very much continuous with their own past as institutions, namely to develop exhibition programming, to create an experience when you visit them uh, based on their own collections, also on uh, borrowed collections, materials from other collections. Um, between that physical experience, the visit, so to speak, and uh, this larger sort of presence that they have in the world of the World Wide Web, where maybe their entire collections are on view. Uh, uh, collections that, as I uh, hinted at before, are probably only very, very partially on view when you actually visit the physical galleries. Let me give you a com concrete example. In the case of major uh, institutions like the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, which is actually not one institution, but a whole constellation of related museums. The Smithsonian Institution has an absolutely vast collection made up of millions of extraordinarily heterogeneous objects. And uh, they are so heterogeneous that they run from locks of hair to uh, everyday household objects from the 18th century to aircraft and spaceships. <laughs> now, when you have a collection that is that heterogeneous and that vast, it is of course impossible to exhibit that collection to the public. You can only exhibit very small portions of that collection. Even for people who work on the inside of those organizations, only very large portions of their collections are visible or accessible. I've heard estimates that are something in the range of maybe five to 10% of the Smithsonian's collections that are accessible to uh, or viewable 
at any time during their history. Uh, so what do we do with all the rest? We may have photographs, we may have descriptions of them. Uh, obviously, they contain a lot of information and knowledge that is of extreme interest, certainly to scholars and researchers, perhaps also to members of the general public. Uh, so the challenge of what we do with all these collections, what we do with all these data resources, uh, uh, how we make them matter, how we uh, overcome some of the limitations of the analog world where we can't exhibit that 85 or 90 percent or 95 percent even of objects that are too big or just too many to be exhibited. Uh, they'll just have to wait their turn, obviously. Maybe that waiting might last for many centuries how through the creative and innovative use of digital platforms and resources do we create tools that allow that off-site visit to actually break the logjam, to create meaningful modes of access, to create the possibility, for instance, of doing things with collections. And by doing things, I mean everything from creating programming that's distinctively digitally based programming, in other words, digital curation of otherwise dormant collections, collections in deep storage, um, or um, also do, by doing, I also mean that in many cases, many of these collections are not fully classified or described. They're collections that live in a kind of limbo. Um, they are in this sort of deep storage. And a lot of the knowledge that would animate them, that would make them matter, that would help us to understand their significance, that would show the connections between them and other categories of objects, other collections, are not in the hands of experts. They're, 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 we're talking about forms of knowledge that are uh, typically uh, you know, known by people who somehow experienced a moment in history or who were part of a research process or who somehow have some kind of local or particular or personal interest in a category of objects. So how do we leverage the power of the community to add value to the cultural record, to really make it humanity's cultural patrimony, not just a, a kind of collection that's owned by a privileged institution that gathers and collects? Those are the kinds of questions that interest me as a, a digital humanist, as a knowledge designer. And um, I've been involved in a number of projects, I'm actively involved in, at MetaLab in a number of projects that are really trying to think about how we can create platforms that allow us to more, more richly describe cultural objects, not to reduce them to a single photograph, a snapshot, and a, a record that says creator or artist, you know, material, date, place, but rather you know, objects tell stories that are much more interesting than just creator, place, or date. They tell us stories about whole communities of um, individuals. They tell us stories about relationships between objects, about genealogies. They tell us stories about industry and materials. They tell us stories about collectors who saw connections between objects and chose them for some particular reason. Maybe it was imperial conquest. Maybe it was a kind of eccentric interest in um, certain decorative motifs and their evolution. Uh, um, in short, the opportunity for creating a much richer set of models of description on the one side and on the other side for thinking about how we expand the conversation around uh, cultural objects or um, uh, objects that document moments in history. Um, and by expanding, I mean bringing scholars in, into the conversation directly, not just uh, expecting that objects will be mediated by curators who make decisions about what gets included or excluded from being presented or re represented, but also members of the general public who may have a, a, a deep interest in a particular set of objects because they tell a story that has to do very directly with their own immediate circumstances, the place that they live or uh, their family history. Uh, I think it's by expanding the contours of this kind of cultural conversation that we can both address some of the impasses, some of the log jams that institutions of memory like museums face, but also create a kind of animated archive, a kind of animated museum space where collections live and breathe in a way that uh, transcends the sort of deep storage model of culture.
among the kinds of museums that I think um, illustrate the challenges and as well as the tremendous opportunities of this shift in focus, uh, this kind of shift towards um, emphasizing the, the sort of off-site visit alongside the on-site visit are science museums. Science museums have a very explicit educational vocation. Uh, they are there to document the history of science, but also to teach science. Um, so, uh, and by the way, I would argue that that is also the case for art museums, <laughs> that they need to do exactly the same thing. In both cases, we have uh, the challenge of bringing historical materials alive in a sense, in a way that speaks to people in their own time, in the present, and uh, in that process of bringing alive, of course, um, we uh, have face a whole series of challenges of how we translate, how we create contexts around objects. Let's take the example of a microscope or, uh, in other words, a physical artifact that was part of a larger research process. Now that object, if we treat it as an isolated object, which is of course the traditional museological technique, we would put it in a display case, we put a label next to it, maybe we put a little bit of a text that says this was used by person X at a certain time. Well, we've told a very small story. That object really signifies in the context of the whole structure of a laboratory, in the context of the whole structure of a research procedure, in the context of a story about optics, about how microscope and telescope design changed over the course of the history of each of those artifacts. In, uh, in short, they, a microscope tells many different stories. <laughs> and um, I think a museological context where we have the richness of the object as an experience you can visit, you can experience face to face, but where we are able to surround it with increasingly rich other elements that begin to tell these other stories that are much more complex, much more sort of interwoven with one another, I think we begin to also answer the question about the educational mission of these institutions, about how they can perform that mission more effectively. Uh, so I see the web-based environments actually as not separate from the challenge of how we redesign the physical environments of a museum as a space. I see them actually as deeply intertwined. And I think the real challenge is to create a, a kind of community that's actively engaged with using collections, teaching collections, telling stories with collections, uh, that is also visible inside the physical space, the exhibition spaces of, uh, for instance, a science museum. <laughs>